From bloated and tired to free and inspired, welcome to Free and Inspired Radio with Philip Watkins, your weekly dose of everything digestion and mental health related. We hope you enjoy this episode. Here is your host, Philip Watkins. Yes, yes. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Free and Inspired Radio. I'm your host, a naturopathic practitioner, Philip Watkins, and I'm grateful to have you with us today. If you're new to the show, well, the title says it all. It's all about feeling free and inspired and exploring the many different avenues you can take to get there, whether it's deep dives on digestion and mental health solutions or guests who offer their own stories and answers. I hope I can be the type of guide you can rely on to unlock the agency you have to reach your own mental and physical competency. Let's get started with what's coming up on today's episode. Coming up on this week's show. Welcome, 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 Herbs and Spices. It's episode 42 of Free and Inspired Radio. Thanks for joining us again this week. Before we get started, I wanted to say a big thank you as Free and Inspired Radio hit its first significant landmark this week and we crossed over 1,000 downloads across the world. Everyone from Singapore, obviously Hong Kong, through to all Brazil, uh, Italy. Very, very grateful that people are listening to the show And previous to doing this podcast in my my old radio days, we always used to joke about never really knowing if anyone was listening or even whether it was actually valuable at all. And I'm hoping these numbers uh, show that the information that we're putting together uh, on a weekly basis is helping. Enough of that, though. Let's get into this week's episode. And this week, we're going to be asked what to do if your SIBO breath test symptoms, uh, sorry, your SIBO breath test comes back clear, but you still have IBS symptoms. So you've been through the biphasic diet to fix your SIBO and gut health issues and worked hard to get to the retest to see how things have gone. You feel better than you did when you started, which is obviously the point right but however the complete remission hasn't arrived yet and when this type of thing happens it can make you and your practitioner a little dubious about what could be in the test results or the retest results rather surprisingly the SIBO results come back clear so you're like wait a minute you know this is what we're looking for you know we're also looking for an improvement in your symptoms though so if those haven't disappeared what do we do next Fear not if you are in the 1% of people who find themselves in this position. The reason may be totally normal and now measurable. That reason is the presence of another group of bacteria along with the hydrogen and methane producers. So instead of producing the two gases mentioned above, this group of bacteria forms another gas called hydrogen sulfide. Until the last few years, hydrogen sulfide has been challenged very challenging to measure due to its sensitive nature in lab testing. It does though present with some specific symptoms and in this episode we're going to look deeper into that. So let's look into this sulfur forming bacteria and some solutions. Bacteria that produce hydrogen sulfide are a classic example of the transcension of seeing bacteria as good or bad. Now let me explain. When introducing the results of stool tests for my patients, for example, I often start by suggesting that we are moving past bacteria as being good or bad in a broader sense. So sure, gram-negative bacteria such as Klebsiella species, for example, can bring inflammation and acute infection. But however, most of the time, we're more concerned with high or low bacteria levels and ensuring things are balanced than anything else. Hence, SIBO is called a bacterial, or sorry, it's called a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth rather than a small intestinal bacterial infection. So more often than not, high levels of bacteria cause issues and low levels are not enough. So this sweet spot is what we refer to as a U-shaped curve. So there is a sweet spot there and hydrogen sulfide is a great example. 
Hydrogen sulfide bacteria are an essential component of the microbiota. And furthermore, the hydrogen sulfide created has numerous therapeutic benefits in the body, specifically within the digestive system. So much so that hydrogen sulfide has been extensively researched in the hope of new medication options. For example, Early research in animals suggests that hydrogen sulfide versions of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, drugs such as Panadol, are more effective than the original versions and cause significantly fluor, fluor, significantly fewer gastric issues. How's me and my announcing this week? It seems as though uh, it might also be the case with a common pharmaceutical drug, mesalamine, which is often used in inflammatory bowel conditions such as ulcerative colitis. In the digestive system, hydrogen sulfide produced by the bacteria we are looking at can reduce inflammation. And this is why the hydrogen sulfide derivatives of mesalamine, especially in inflammatory bowel conditions like ulcerative colitis, can be really valuable. So hydrogen sulfide reduces inflammation by strengthening the component of the immune system that defends your digestive lining called the mucosal defense. Some studies have labeled hydrogen sulfide as the bridge between this mucosal defense and the microbiome, reducing inflammation to a point where it's, it's a primary focus for healing gastric ulcers. So that leads us to a question of if hydrogen sulfide is so essential to our digestive and immune system, why is it a problem? Well, that's an excellent question. And high levels of hydrogen sulfide bacteria are also associated with things like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and irritable bowel syndrome. Certain situations can exponentially increase hydrogen sulfide producing bacteria. And we're going to explore all of these things and more and what to do after the break here on free and inspired radio we'll be back with more in one moment Woo! time to take a break are you enjoying this episode of free and inspired radio there's no better time to take back your personal health sovereignty if you want to connect with more free and inspired episodes Simply subscribe to your favorite podcast platform or visit the website at www.philipwatkins.health for more information. Let's get back to the show. Yes, yes, welcome back to episode 42 of Free and Inspired Radio. In the first part of the show, we've been investigating hydrogen sulfide and its connection to your digestive symptoms especially in the case of a clear SIBO result we've looked at the role that it can play in your body but it does get elevated and it does become a problem and this is what we're going to look at now when we are assessing hydrogen sulfide and how it can make your IBS symptoms worse so the first is diet so here's a really interesting one right so a high meat diet increased hydrogen sulfide production by up to 15 times. In contrast, decreasing meat and dietary protein intake reduced the growth and production of hydrogen sulfide bacteria. So this is an interesting one for the biphasic diet, especially if you're doing the animal-based one, right? Because you, a lot of people tend to really increase their animal protein during a biphasic treatment, but in some cases that can actually make the hydrogen sulfide worse. So once again, if you're here because you've had a SIBO result that's clear, but your IBS symptoms are still there, sometimes you just some extra work may be needed to clear that hydrogen sulfide. One particular amino acid from dietary protein, cysteine, and the bacteria it's connected to are some common species you might see tested in a comprehensive stool test. For example, Fusobacterium, Clostridium, Escheria, Salmonella, Salmonella, Klebsiella, Streptococcus, Desulfovibrio, and Enterobacter are all connected with hydrogen sulfide. Hence the connection with dietary protein intake because cysteine as an amino acid increases all of those bacteria. Dairy and saturated fat intake also contribute to the increased abundance of the hydrogen sulfide bacteria species listed above, especially the main one, or specifically the main one, the sulfur vibrio, which we can test in your stool. One particular type of prescriptive diet for IBS can also increase hydrogen sulfide. 
And this is where we start to see the standard SIBO treatments that aren't the complete solution here, especially if you're one of the people I mentioned at the beginning who have got negative SIBO results without experiencing a change. So get this, low FODMAP diets can increase hydrogen sulfide bacteria. I'm going to repeat that. Low FODMAP diets can increase hydrogen sulfide bacteria. So this increase automatically means a higher FODMAP diet for treating hydrogen sulfide. Already a significant part of the difference between the typical SIBO treatment that we know and love and works really well and the type of overgrowth that we're discussing here. Now, the for now though, you can see some key connections with the diet unintentionally the majority of the time building these hydrogen sulfide bacteria. As the hydrogen sulfide begins to increase, so can diarrhea-based IBS symptoms. Studies released in 2016 have already confirmed that breath tests with hydrogen sulfide levels that differ from healthy subjects can help to explain the origin of SIBO. This difference was primarily in cases of IBS-D or diarrhea-dominant IBS. The, this higher prevalence of hydrogen sulfide and IBSD is down to higher levels of sulfide, hydrogen sulfide bacteria increasing what we call motility. So just think the conveyor belt your food travels on to get to the toilet. So hydrogen sulfide bacteria can increase motility, especially when there is a disturbance in the bacterial diversity of the digestive system or if you are a regular listener to the show, you'll be familiar with the term dysbiosis. So if dysbiosis is present, then hydrogen sulfide will increase motility further, and this can be a problem. So remember all of the species that we mentioned previously or a little earlier, if there are high levels of all of those, then this is where this increased motility makes more sense. And the cool thing is we can test for that, right? Higher levels of hydrogen sulfide can also have cellular consequences as well. These elevated levels interfere with how your cells create energy and increase what I call the body's natural rusting process, which is called oxidative damage that you may have come across before. For those who like some science on these things, increased levels of hydrogen sulfide impair the production of adenosine triphosphate or ATP, an essential component of your energy production. So it literally interferes with that there. And hey, anyone get fatigued with their IBS? It's such a big symptom, isn't it? So there you go. So we might have an uh, if hydrogen sulfide bacteria are interfering with your energy production processes, kind of explains that fatigue. And when people's fatigue doesn't clear up during their SIBO treatment, there is this is a definite sign that something else is going on. And I always see people's energy clear up so quickly using the SIBO biphasic diet or the treatment that if it doesn't, it's a big red flag. The big problem with these high hydrogen sulfide cellular effects is also the increased colonic inflammation and damage. This inflammation and damage are why higher hydrogen sulfide levels can cause ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Interestingly, early research also associates the disulfur vibrio species with periodontist, periodontitis excuse me, and obesity, would you believe? So this is an interesting one, but I think the research is a little unclear, so we won't go too far with the obesity. But the periodontitis one, if you're interested in how the health of your teeth, gums, and mouth play a big role in your IBS symptoms or SIBO. I've done a whole episode on the oral microbiome, and I think it was episode 39, 38. I can't remember. Please excuse me. Go and check it out if you're interested because you might find it to be something if you haven't visited the dentist for a while. It's probably time. So the question I hear most, how do I know if hydrogen sulfide bacteria contributes to my SIBO and IBS? Well, we've touched on some of the main we've touched on some of the main symptoms already. If your IBS is diarrhea dominant, and that then that's an initial clue. We've also touched on the the, the fatigue as well. Research though is still confirming if hydrogen sulfide is specifically for IBS D or IBS diarrhea dominant because there are studies confirming that IBS C 
or constipation dominant IBS have high levels of hydrogen sulfide in breath tests in one study. So once again, let's just give it time and see how things come out. Also, having odorous gas, just we'll say it plain and simple, strong smelling farts, they can also be a sign of hydrogen sulfide as well. There can be also histamine-based problems such as skin issues or pain sensitivity, which we see a lot. However, these are primarily clinical symptoms that haven't really been confirmed in the research yet. So there can be other reasons for those, especially histamine as well, because obviously it's such a connection to the gut. Interestingly, another critical marker that you might not know of if you've had some blood, te blood tests is low zinc levels. Zinc has been one of the minerals shown to bind to hydrogen sulfide, and this classically deficient mineral can play a significant role in managing the hydrogen sulfide levels in your gut. An easier way to find out about hydrogen sulfide and SIBO in general is to test it. And once again, we've touched on the testing a little bit through this episode, but stool testing can now identify the disulfur vibrio species and the other sulfur species that we looked at earlier in the episode. Often this can be a fast-tracked way to get a clearer outlook on what's happening. Even better news if you're in the US is that uh, Mark Pimentel and his team of researchers have created the Trio Smart breath test, which measures all three gases that we see in SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, so hydrogen, methane, and now hydrogen sulfide. So if you're in the US and you wish to become a patient with me, uh, we can organize that test for you. You can also explore your body's ability to deal with sulfur by looking at your genetics, specifically CBS gene, the CBS gene which can give you some indications on how your body deals with sulfur, and that can be a big deal as well. Now, we've touched on, obviously, a, this is a, definitely a gateway for you if you've got, you know, you're in these situations and you want to deal with your IBS, obviously, but I think there's an important note on rushing to treat hydrogen sulfide dominance and that important note is to ask why it's high in the first place. I mentioned the positive effects of this gas earlier in the episode for, for a few reasons. And the first was to try to dispel the idea of bacteria being just bad or just good. The second was to help with the understanding that maybe hydrogen sulfide, especially if it's measured in a breath test, is there in higher levels for a reason. Hydrogen sulfide is exceptionally anti-inflammatory for the digestive system and in the case of stool exams that come back with high levels of other inflammation markers, it could be the result of an adaptation to the inflammation process present in the gut rather than anything else. So the hydrogen sulfide bacteria could actually be trying to help. And in this case, I tend to agree with my colleagues about leaning on testing too much and not treating the whole picture regarding the digestive system. When the hydrogen sulfide is high because of inflammation, it's most likely that they correct, correct themselves when the inflammation is dealt with, as opposed to going in and clearing the, the bacteria specifically. So I guess I'm just trying to say that all of this isn't cut, as cut and dry as it seems, although we can test, so that helps, obviously. However, if you are a person who's gone through your SIBO protocol and still has symptoms, I hope this episode offers some reassurance that there are reasons why this might be the case. Better still, they can be measured and acted upon to free you from those gut issues for good. And that's what we're all about, isn't it, on Free and Inspire Radio, getting free so that you can feel inspired again. Now, before we finish this free and inspired radio episode, if you would love to hear more from me and get the word on new articles, podcasts, episodes, and everything else, jump over to the website, philipwatkins.health, and join our community via the newsletter. And you can also get yourself a free ebook, Psychobiotics or Probiotics in the Brain, if you're interested in that. And you can jump over there, philipwatkins.health. As for the podcast, your reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify help me get the word on the street. If you're listening to this on YouTube, throw the video a like and subscribe. It's always appreciated. I like to send out shouts to the show listeners as always who get this far. The show is about helping you to find the freedom to feel inspired again. I hope this episode gets you one step closer. Until next week, 
Don't forget to take care of yourself and those around you. And once again, thank you for everyone who has gotten for an Inspire Radio to its first major landmark of a 1,000 downloads. It's very, very appreciated. And if you have any feedback, any subjects you'd like me to cover, anything like that, remember the show is for you. So if there's anything you're interested in, throw me a line through the comments on YouTube, anywhere you can find in the website. Contact us through there. Once again, also, if you want to become a patient of myself, then feel free to get in contact via the website and we'll be able to schedule an appointment for you or at least answer any questions you may have. For now, have yourself a great day and thanks for being with us this week on Free and Inspired Radio. Oh my gosh, you made it to the end. This show is all about you, and we hope you finished this episode feeling one step closer to feeling free and inspired. We'll be back next week, but if you want to know more about Philip, please catch a digital flight to www.philipwatkins.health for further details about how we might be able to help. In the meantime, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, and we'll see you for another episode next week.